Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, whichever works for your part of the world. Thank you for logging on with FLO and DSMP, Bureau of Medical Services Deployment Stress Management Program, for this workshop on enriching relationships during an unaccompanied tour. My name is Eileen Smith, and I am the unaccompanied tours officer here in FLO. I am accompanied by Christiana Montminy, a licensed clinical social worker from DSMP who will facilitate this workshop. Just a few more items of business and I will turn the session over to our presenter and subject matter expert, Christiana. If you haven't received the participant workbook, please write to us at flowaskut at state.gov. I also want to remind everyone to visit the Family Liaison Office website in order to find valuable information on topics like EFM employment, life events, naturalization, education, and of course, unaccompanied tours. We are easy to find on the web. Just Google our name, Family Liaison Office, into any search engine and we are first to come up in your web browser. And don't forget our blog, Foggy Bottom Rambles, which you can find the same way, just Google Foggy Bottom Rambles into any web browser to see information on current events, webinars, EFM job openings, FSI courses, and much more. With the housekeeping out of the way, I am delighted to introduce Christiana Montminy, who is here to talk to us about how to enrich our relationship during an unaccompanied tour. Welcome, and thank you, Eileen, for that introduction. My name is Christiana Motmany, and I'm a clinical social worker in the Bureau of Medical Services. I work in the Deployment Stress Management Program, an employee assistance program specializing in supporting high threat, high risk, non-permissive environments, and unaccompanied tours, and the employees and their family members who serve at these posts. I'm excited to be here today with the Family Liaison Office to talk about how couples can enrich their relationships during unaccompanied tours and physical separation. Our agenda. Couples separated by physical distance and different time zones may anticipate experiencing challenges in their personal lives. We are privileged to have several couples share their stories of unaccompanied tours with us today in the hopes their lessons learned can be a source of comfort and guidance as you all make your decisions regarding upcoming postings. Together, we will move through the course of a year identifying helpful interventions to navigate separations and time-proven activities to help strengthen the bonds of our most important relationships. Challenges. Let's highlight the biggest challenges our most intimate relationships may face when navigating unaccompanied tours. They include managing different time zones and not living the same day-to-day -day reality, overlooking dates worth celebrating, thinking the worst, which can oftentimes keep us stuck, experiencing perpetual problems and expecting time and space might solve them, and letting our self-care go by the wayside. Interventions, tips, and tools. A few tips. Creating time to mindfully and intentionally connect is always beneficial to any couple. This helps us to feel included in, in the goings-on of our partners. Couples who are geographically separated recognize the importance of time. I encourage you to identify three things you do daily that waste time you could otherwise be spending on your relationship. Facebook comes to mind for me. And ask yourself, can you monitor these behaviors? Can you set boundaries to protect your time? Identify your rituals of connection. What do you want to celebrate? Get out your calendar. Identify those important dates and commit to recognizing and experiencing moments of joy and merriment. Have a sense of expectation management. It's unfair and unrealistic to assume time and space will solve the challenges couples face. This assumption will quickly feel burdensome. And finally, make taking care of oneself a priority, a consistent habit and a personal responsibility. It creates a foundation of health. Pre-planning considerations. In anticipation of a tour that will cause physical separation amongst intimate partners, it is imperative to prioritize what needs to be done and in what time frame, to identify actionable tasks and those who can provide support in its many forms to us, 
and to the concerns and fears we possess so that we don't suffer in silence and invite resentment to grow. Let's watch Cecile and Keith discuss real life pre-planning and preparatory considerations. So what do you remember about planning for our unaccompanied adventures? I remember that there was usually a large event in the world and that you would come home and say that you felt a need to serve. And I would, of course, ask you the question, why? Why do you feel compelled to go? How long will you be gone? What's going on? How could you make a difference? Yeah, that was, uh, I think uh, the Somalia was that way. And then, of course, the post 9 11 Iraq and Afghanistan, that was, that was common. I think all of us were looking for some way to be involved. Mm -hmm. And how about the, what was the next phase of decision making? Well, after many hours of uh, discussing the, the need to go and, or not go, we would, also, we would start immediately shift over to the kids because they were our main concern, and there's four of them, and they were in different age, age stages. So, you know, how, what's going to be best for them? Um, how would this move affect them? How are we going to tell them? How are we going to get their buy-in on it? How will we do it so that you're, they're not scared? Right. Right, the, emotion, the schools and the emotional impact were the things I remember we talked through about, about <clears throat> given their ages and where they were in life, how this was going to impact on them and what was the best way to do it, what was the best time to go, how long to go, and what we needed to, to, uh, to support us in the, in the process. And then what about resources? I've, I've, I've thought about some of the resources that, were, that are available to, to, uh, to help families prepare. Well, I was concerned about are we going to stay here? Are we going to go back to the States? I think that was pretty much a no-brainer because we didn't have a home in the States. And there's four of them, and it's only a year. That's a, that's a lot of moving uh, for just one year. So fortunately, we were able to go to the flow uh, decision tree, and they have that great um, do this, do that. And, and then also it tells you all of the allowances mm -hmm. that are available. So that I felt that was very, very helpful. And then there's the age-appropriate uh, workbooks you can walk through with the kids to uh, to kind of go through with each of them what it means and what it's all about. And then the blogs, I think, are important, too. I think that uh, catching the experiences of other people and how they both dealt with the, ex the, the decision mm -hmm. and then also having made the decision, how they dealt with the, uh, the, the tour itself, I think, was also important. Right. It was nice signing up for the blog and having that come into my email and something to read and, um, you know, to help. To, it felt like I had a support. Mm -hmm. And then the other thing that is, is, is a good product, a good uh, resource, is the Deployment Stress Management Program of MED, which also, again, they have uh, consultants that can help. Uh, they have a number of uh, products uh, to help one look at the, uh, the different uh, aspects of the stress that comes with both preparing for deployment and during the deployment. Also very helpful. I know stress is something that we forget about, that uh, it, it just creeps like a fog. You know, all of a sudden you're stressed out and you don't realize why you're behaving in a certain way. So you're right, re those reminders of stress are very important. Right, and for the kids too, they, they react to stress in different ways and they have their own, their own way of coping and I think trying to understand that and get ahead of that is, is, uh, is important. Also notifying friends and, and uh, schools that you were going to be away so that they would be uh, alert to any strange behaviors mm -hmm. that they might see in the kids or different behaviors, let's put it that way. Yeah, that's what I was thinking about, the, the, the prep phase itself where the deployment is almost upon us and the things that we tried to do to, uh, to get ahead of that. I remember involving the kids uh, at, at whatever age they're at and whatever's appropriate was, was important. Rachel, I remember for the Iraq deployment, wanted to help me pack. That was something that she did not want to be left out. She wanted to feel like it was something she was involved in. All right, so she came down and we packed all night and, and got all the flashlights ready or whatever it is we had to, to prep for the, for the deployment. So that was something for her that was really important. The boys went to sleep. They were, <laughs> they were fine. But all right, that was something she needed. And I think finding that way that they can be involved in it and, uh, you know, at a, at an in an appropriate way. Mm -hmm. I remember we talked a little bit about the danger to them, uh, which was minimal <clears throat> in reality, but uh, they'll, they'll see the news. They'll watch things that might freak them out, so kind of be upfront about the nature of what uh, what I was going to be doing and and uh, and how we mitigated the danger and that sort of thing. I think that was important. I think they all were comfortable with uh, with that part of it. What else? Did you communication. Think? How often will we be able to communicate? And nowadays, communication is a little bit easier. Well, maybe it's a lot easier. But way back when, I remember some very expensive phone calls. Uh, was that the uh, ninety dollar phone call? Yeah, the ninety dollar phone Somalia, calls. Yeah. <laughs> 
<laughs> so I think communication, how often will you be able to communicate? How will you be able to communicate? The other day I was looking through a binder of all of our, our printed emails from one of your tours, which was a nice narrative of uh, what the kids were doing, what you were doing. So that was nice to have. Yeah. And then the final, final financial summits, I remember getting together that last time we'd been, we kind of were together on finances already, but then going through passwords and and, uh, and powers of attorney, making sure everything was in place, mm -hmm. making sure there was nothing left out uh, as we got ready for the for actual uh, departure. So what's your takeaway for other people deciding on a tour like this? Well, I think the main thing was to involve the kids early and throughout the process, get their buy-in and uh, make them a part of the, of the thing so it was a family event. It wasn't just uh, one member going off for a while. Uh, I think that uh, looking carefully at the experiences of others and uh, kind of absorbing some of the things that other families went through, both in how they made the decision and then how they coped with the deployment itself. And then uh, I think not going into the decision-making process with too many preconceived notions, but being open to the, the notion of going home or staying at post. Uh, there's arguments for both, but mm -hmm. being open-minded about that uh, and open-minded about all the other uh, pieces of the decision that will, be, that will play out uh, over the course of the deployment. I think managing expectations is important mm -hmm. too. How, how often will we meet? How often will we communicate? Um, and how and watch out for stressors. Exactly. Great. Okay. You ready to do it again? Yeah. <laughs> yeah sure. <laughs> During an unaccompanied tour, there are several takeaways and lessons learned we can glean from Cecile and Keith's narrative. They both talked about how it's crucial that both partners use effective communication which is best received when it's constructive, and are willing to ask for help from their support systems. Taking good care of oneself helps each partner to feel best prepared to manage the distance and time zones, and setting some reasonable expectations for oneself helps ensure no one puts their lives on hold. What to expect during an r, &R. As we heard in Cecile and Keith's reflections, r rs can bring both joys and challenges. It can be difficult to balance the time and remain present as we anticipate more separation ahead, or identify and process the changes each partner may have experienced in the time apart. However, this respite also affords couples the opportunity to share their lives, realities, fears, and new friends, and experience closeness and reunification. Post unaccompanied tour and looking ahead. Before tours end, couples will want to set a manageable pace for reunification so that they can prioritize family, identify and discuss the changes and growth experienced, renegotiate responsibilities, and embrace new opportunities as they look ahead. Remember, rejoining the long-anticipated end of tour and resumption of normal life will prove, inevitably, that much will have changed in the year with each individual and as a result, the couple. Let's hear now from Chris and Luis as they discuss the lessons learned in their first unaccompanied tour and reintegration. How did we manage our reunion? Mm. You know, it's like we had an unaccompanied tour that went on a lot longer than I think either of us expected. And it had been postponed so many times, I was pretty sure that it was um, going to be postponed yet again. Um, but it was going to come to fruition, and so we were happy about that. Um, I think we were getting that, buying the, we had bought the new house, a house that we both wanted to be in. Um, we were really excited to, to put it together because we had collected so many things from our travels. So turning that house into a home, that was a big part of it, at least for me. Yeah. What about for you? Well, I think for me, it was, uh, God, what helped so much was focusing on what is within our control. Mm -hmm. uh, being in a position in a job at the Foreign Service where flexibility is key, control, I think, for me was important. So looking forward to our quarterly trips that we committed to, mm -hmm. to having, just to uh, reunite yeah. and to be together. Uh, and... Yeah, I think looking forward to our home because putting it together is so important to, to us as a couple and as, indiv as individuals was yeah. uh, critical. You know, and there were, there were certainly challenges associated with yeah. being reunited. And I remember seeing a webinar 
uh, that Flo put on probably a few months before you were moving back. And in the webinar, they talked about how critical it was to communicate leading up into it. And I remember having some conversations with you on the front end, like, you know, we've lived together before in the U.S. We've had um, our, the responsibilities, you know, divided between, between you and me. Um, and after having been overseas for all those years and having GSO to turn to, um, having affordable help that could pick up in areas when we were busy with work or with social activities, those were great aspects. But coming back, it was kind of like, okay, who's washing the dishes? Who's doing the yard work? Um, who's doing laundry this week? Wait, I'm not doing laundry this week. I thought it was your job. <laughs> but talking about those things and working out both on the small end of the spectrum and the big end, like who's doing what? Uh, one of the challenges that's it's definitely it, it sticks out for me, uh, and, and I learned a lot from it, mm -hmm. was um, after talking to staff care. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was the importance of dealing with and managing uh, the closure mm -hmm. of a tour. Yeah. So after being uh, in a very intense environment uh, with lots of professional demands, um, I found it suddenly, unexpectedly, that it was difficult to, to let go and to put closure to it. Mm -hmm. so, so it was that, all while I was looking forward to being home with you. But once I realized how yeah. I needed to manage both, uh, I was able to move forward. Yeah. So it, it, it's, it's, it's a reminder how in the Foreign Service, there are many things going on in our lives that we're not always aware of or attuned to. And and paying attention to what is going on underneath emotionally is, 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 is critical and it's important and talking to a professional when needed is also important. Well, and I remember you had suggested that I meet with you know, someone from staff care as well to get that support. And I said, oh, I don't, I don't need it, I don't need it. And then eventually, I think it was after speaking to somebody else that they said, you really ought to take advantage of it. It's just getting a, you know, a third party's advice and guidance and I was really glad I was really glad that I did ultimately because it gave us more kind of structure and how to handle that right. aspect of the reintegration I think for me also on the kind of the more celebratory side was having things to look forward to oh, yeah. and having them planned in advance of your arrival so shortly after you returned we did a vacation at the beach with friends we did a couple of staycations where we put together the house and took advantage of that time just to be together again. And, and so that, in addition to knowing that we would be together for birthdays, holidays, family events, that was all important. Right. And then I think, oh gosh, and I'm glad we did it this way. It worked for us. Um, it is overwhelming. It's an overwhelming experience. And I think a way that, that, that we managed it, and I certainly think we did the right thing, was focusing and prioritizing our reunion, our relationship first. first yeah. uh, and then eventually focusing on meeting with family, reunions with friends. Yeah. Yeah. And, and for, for us, I think it worked. It's worked actually quite well yeah. in, in a way that made everything else meaningful yeah. rather than overwhelming us yeah. uh, ourselves even more. Yeah. Otherwise, it would, it would have felt like another home leave. <laughs> yeah, That's true. I think the guidance that I would give to other people is that, number one, you know, I've, we've always taken great pride in our communication, but I think making sure that people talk about the, not only the great parts of the reunion, but the challenges, Absolutely. the division of responsibilities, if yes. there are those responsibilities, um, reaching out to staff care or whoever to get some support because I think it was easy to underestimate how challenging it might be. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, as simple as uh, the, the, the simple things, the daily things of life that one for, think just underestimates routines, yeah. uh, chores, as you talked about earlier. It's constantly change is inevitable, uh, but so is adjustment. And, and so life moves on and so we adjust and so how we go about our routines, uh, especially when you come back together, yeah. is, is important to keep in mind that everyone's adjusting, everyone's changing, so. Yeah. Yeah. 
Communication. We just heard Chris and Louise talk about the importance of healthy communication, which starts with paying attention to what's going on underneath in terms of an individual's experiences and the dynamic in a couple. All couples communicate verbally and non-verbally. In spoken communication, we are best able to express ourselves and listen with our whole being when we are giving our full attention and aren't otherwise distracted, are constructive, use I statements, Avoid using a critical tone or words. Listen to hear, not respond. Avoid blaming or shaming. And work to make sure our partners feel understood. Conflict resolution. All couples experience conflict. Knowing how to work towards a resolution, which is most often a palatable compromise, not a straightforward win, requires us to actively disengage from problem-focused thinking. Blaming never benefits a couple, and shaming never benefits a couple. Some tips for effective conflict resolution include constructive efforts to speak openly, calmly, and in a way that allows partners to work together, reinforces we can each present solutions and stop using problem-focused or people-focused thinking and blaming. Set a time to talk. Work to actively define the problem. Realize that having a timeout may be a good idea if the argument heats up. Brainstorm together after the problem has been identified. Agree on a possible solution. Commit to a specific action and look for growth and change. Finally, remember to set up a meeting to check on the progress or regroup to try something else. The gift of forgiveness. Forgiveness is a choice to free ourselves from anger and resentment. Forgiveness promotes healing and inner peace. Taking responsibility for feelings and actions is cathartic for both parties, and an apology can minimize the distance between two people. Managing stress. This managing stress matrix designed by Dr. David Olson and Karen Olson from the Prepare and Rich program helps us to identify where we have power and what our priorities are with respect to action and our energy reserves. This tool can assist individuals and couples decide on the issues they want to address in constructive dialogue. For instance, a couple's highest priorities are those they deem the most critical to the relationship and those they find most capable of affecting change over. Conversely, those that are lowest priority are those that may be difficult to change or perhaps can even be accepted. I invite individuals and couples to utilize this matrix, just as we heard Cecile and Keith and Chris and Louise did. Self-care. When each of us mindfully and deliberately care for our bodies, minds, and hearts daily, we maintain our best selves. Anyone in any relationship with us benefits from this, as do we. Beyond being a personal responsibility, taking care of ourselves is a joyful experience. We honor ourselves by promoting and cultivating habits which replenish our beings. It's always the right time to encourage oneself to think honestly about what we are doing to deliberately be your healthiest and happiest. For your consideration, we'll be moving into the workbook, so I'd like us all to pause and honestly reflect on the potential or possible existence of these danger signs in our closest relationships. If these behaviors aren't strangers to us, the tools and skills highlighted in the workbook can help. Please don't be alarmed if these behaviors might be present to include recognizing the urge to up the ante, dismissing our partner's thoughts or feelings, withdrawing from our loved ones, or doubting each other's motives, because we can choose to behave differently. Workbook. The Deployment Stress Management Program is happy to assist couples in utilizing these tools, which are activities of connection. Our staff clinicians can also facilitate couples' work to improve communication during unaccompanied tours. You aren't alone, and support is available. Unaccompanied tour etiquette. Setting the tone or having expectation management is helpful when couples are preparing for an unaccompanied tour. Identify realistic and reasonable logistics. Discuss dreams and fears. Openly identifying these joins partners together. This communication might make us feel vulnerable, but it strengthens our bonds. Relationship growth. Dreams and challenges 
can be shared and therefore successfully worked towards or hurdled. Sharing openly allows couples the intimacy of vulnerability, really involving the other person in our desires, fears, and realities. Identify your bucket list. Set and discuss realistic goals for the year ahead. Doing so grows our relationships. Shared qualities. Couples find discussing shared qualities to be an enjoyable conversation. Reflecting on what two people together are good at or what challenges they face as a unit solidifies their identity as a team. Brainstorm together to identify more shared qualities and have fun. Connection activities. Talk about the logistics of activities of connection. The how, when, where, and why is important. Identify the mechanism by which you and your partner can communicate and share the important and mundane so you both feel privy to each other's real-time experiences. The stress-reducing conversation. The stress-reducing conversation assists all couples in having connected dialogue in feeling heard and supported. Dr. John Gottman is an expert in marriages, communication, and connection. In his book with Nan Silver, The Seven Principles for Making Marriage Work, a practical guide from the country's foremost expert, he emphasizes the importance of regular use of the stress-reducing conversation. Simply put, we can help our partners and feel connected to one another when we invite our partner to discuss their day, listen by being fully present, communicate our understanding, and take our partner's side by being emotionally supportive. We don't need to problem solve. We just need to be a source of support, validating their feelings. We should then switch roles and afford our partner the opportunity to know how we are experiencing the world, and in turn reinforce we are a united front together. Squash those ants. Anyone can be prone to experiencing automatic negative thoughts, which can spiral quickly out of control and rob us of our rational thinking skills and problem-solving capabilities. It is oftentimes helpful to share our ants with our partners or trusted support system, allowing us to gain perspective and space so we can take steps to find solutions. Self-soothing. Knowing how to calm yourself when you are feeling overwhelmed so you can resume effective communication is essential, and it's a simple enough skill to learn and practice self-soothing. Add a benefit to the positive relational outcomes, it feels good. Self-soothing encourages one to be comfortable, pay close attention to breathing by taking deep and full breaths, relaxing and then tightening or squeezing individual muscles, feeling tension released, and envisioning calming images. Coming home. Unaccompanied tours before, during, and after are stressful periods of time. Speaking to someone connects us to support and highlights other perspectives. I invite you to contact the Deployment Stress Management Program during this journey at any juncture at medecs at state.gov. We provide free and confidential support services. We can facilitate communication as couples work to identify their gains, reintegrate after separations, and develop a new routine as they look ahead together. Self-assessment. If you complete the assessment and find yourself or you and your partner using these destructive communication patterns regularly, I encourage you to reach out to the Deployment Stress Management Program. We can assist or make a referral to a provider who will accept your insurance. We are all capable of change and using positive and effective communication. Resources. Some of the resources that informed today's webinar include these resources. Thank you for joining me, Christiana Motmany, a licensed clinical social worker from the Deployment Stress Management Program, as we discussed enriching relationships during an unaccompanied tour. I trust you found our time together helpful as you reflect on the kinds of relationships you want to have with your loved ones please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any questions. Thank you, Christiana. That was great information. Before we close, I want to remind everyone that if you have questions regarding this webinar or unaccompanied tours, please contact 
flowaskut at state.gov or dsmp at medecs at state.gov. And that's medecs at state.gov. Thank you again for attending this workshop, and we hope that you gleaned some valuable insights about enriching relationships during an unaccompanied tour.